Hey girl, my name is Anel. Welcome to the Brave and Hurt podcast, where we inspire, empower, and motivate by sharing our stories of bravery. I strongly believe that by sharing our stories, we open ourselves to healing, but also serve to give hope and inspiration to those who are dealing with a tough situation. We will talk about all topics under the sun. Now let's hear your stories of bravery. Hey girl, um, this is Anel. Um, welcome back to the Brave and Her. Um, in today's episode, we have Monica Rigg. Uh, she's a wife and mom of two and one on her way. Um, she's here to uh, tell us her story about um, when she lost her baby, her first baby. And uh, she's just here to tell us her journey and her story about grief, grieving her baby. Um, hi, Monica. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Uh, <laughs> we've been knowing each other for many, many years, but uh, oh, yeah. but we we haven't really talked, um, you know, like uh, like on Zoom or something like that, or or even in person in many years too. So yeah, it's uh, been it's been quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we're um, catching up a little bit. And then, um, but why don't you start with um, just introducing yourself, telling us a little bit about yourself, your family, and um, so we can get to know you. Okay, so yeah, my name is Monica. I'm 35. I'm actually, well, I guess I'm a retired dental hygienist now, because um, <laughs> now with my little one, I'm a stay-at-home mom. I'm also a Leo wife, so that's a whole new other situation um but yeah it's just my husband and I we live in Winchester with my little one with chickens or pups <laughs> so if you hear any um clucking or tweeting we have a mama hen inside the house right now she just had babies so it's kind of funny her and I becoming moms <laughs> right now <Aww. laughs> um how old is how old is your your kid your girl your little girl she she's two she'll be three in december oh okay so she's in that cute stage oh she's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so with my nephews when people would tell me about the terrible twos i'm like there's no terrible twos they're fine like they're just having fun and then now with this one with my little girl i was like oh okay i get it now <laughs> so much i mean she's not terrible um like she's the sweetest kindest uh little one ever she just has so much energy she wants to climb on up everything jump off everything so you know little heart attacks here and there thinking like please don't get hurt please don't break anything so it's just that sounds about right <laughs> yeah that's how the little ones are they have like so much energy i don't know where they get it from man like it's like they they drank a red bull in the morning or something that that's exactly it like right when she wakes up it's just go 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 till right before she goes to sleep and I'm like it's aren't you tired and she's doing handstands tumbling on the bed because she's in gymnastics oh, uh, <laughs> so that's her new favorite thing oh. uh, yeah <laughs> so we'll see how it is with her and then when the baby comes <laughs> maybe she'll sl slow down a little bit and help mom Oh, yeah. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, we're training her right now. We bought her two babies. So oh. far, it's going good. Good. Good, good. <laughs> um, so do you want to um, tell us your story um, from wherever you want to start? Um, yeah. Um, so with my first, um, so my second, her name is Francesca. My first, her name is London, London Amelia. When I was pregnant with London, um, you know, as a first time mom, you're excited. Mm -hmm. um, everything's going great. You know, even at the doctor appointments, everything was going great. Um, we made it till, let's see, maybe seven months. Um, and the doctor still said everything was fine. But we started noticing that I was getting a little more swollen. Um, I know swelling is a typical symptom in pregnancy. But this type of swelling, I know if I could show you a picture, my husband would be like, 
you have a fat suit on. Like that's, it looks, your feet look fake. Like it looks like somebody just blew a bunch of air. Maybe I'll send you the picture later. <laughs> okay. But it's, um, it was extreme. And so we raised concern uh, to my doctor, but, but they were still fine. And obviously it being my first pregnancy, I didn't really advocate that much because I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. Um, let's see, by the 30 week appointment, we go in and they don't typically always do an ultrasound at all the appointments. Um, but that day my doctor was like, you know what, dad's here. Let's go ahead and do an ultrasound so he can see the baby. So we did. And then the doctor got quiet and I'm kind of like, what's going on? So he showed me, he said, do you see this big black thing, this big black mass in her abdomen? And I said, yeah. He said, that's, um, uh, that's either her bladder or, well, we're thinking it's her bladder. And he's like, maybe she hasn't emptied it because babies, they drink the amniotic fluid and then they, they pee it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's like, why don't you come back, go walk for an hour and then we'll check again. So I did that. I come back and the mass actually got bigger. Like she's still drinking amniotic fluid, but she's not, you know, um, mm -hmm. being out. Mm -hmm. So he sends me to a specialist and they realize that whatever this mass is, they still can't figure if it's actually the bladder or if it's her uterus or, or if it's just a cyst, it's so big that it cut off um, the ureters and now the kidneys can't function. So the kidneys are backed up and there's, it's starting to cause damage. So they admit me to the hospital just so they can keep an eye on her. Mm -hmm. Um, but like I said, uh, the doctors have done so many tests. I even had an MRI done, an MRI done, and they still couldn't figure it out. Um, and then they try to like think, well, what if we try to drain this mass? But there's risk to that too. They don't know if it's a bladder, if it's a cyst. Like, is that going to cause mom harm? Um, should we deliver at a certain uh amount of weeks or what? So I was in the hospital maybe for like three weeks and finally I told my doctor something's telling me that we like you said 34 weeks would be the earliest to deliver and something's telling me like we should do that so at 34 weeks they okay. scheduled uh -huh. well, through all this time uh -huh. Uh -huh. while you're in the hospital and you know all this is going on with the baby uh -huh. um Instead of you, did you feel any symptoms or did you feel sick or anything like that? Or was it just, you know, what the doctors would see in the ultrasounds and the MRIs? Just what the doctor would see. The only symptom that I would get was the swelling. But even when I was at the hospital, all the nurses were like concerned with the swelling. Um, they were putting compression socks on me. They were putting that machine to like massage my legs mm -hmm. and they couldn't figure out why it wouldn't go down. And obviously they were monitoring my diet at the hospital so it's like this is weird so you would think maybe um like preeclampsia or gestational diabetes but no I didn't have any of that um yeah so that that was a crazy thing like I felt I felt totally fine well obviously I was a, a nervous wreck but um <laughs> physically <laughs> yeah um so the baby, she was breached because, you know, it was still pretty early. Um, I guess babies don't flip till later is what they were telling me. Uh, so at 34 weeks, she was still breached. And the doctor said, you know, if we're going to deliver her, it's going to have to be a C-section. And I said, that's fine. So he, while they were preparing me, he said, I'm going to have you meet with palliative care. And in my head, I'm thinking like, why? She's just going to be in the NICU, you know, probably for a while. Um, the plan was to have her in there. She was probably going to do dialysis because both of her kidneys were already completely damaged at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and then just wait for a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. um, but 
he had people come in to kind of prepare me like what if she passes but I just didn't want to believe in that you know um which is funny because I had one visitor come in I had just met her she was a secretary of um my father-in-law who's a pastor and she came in and she talked to me she prayed with me she gave me a little book and then she walked away and I looked at that book and it's it, it was about you know, people passing. And again, it's like, is God trying to tell me something? Because I don't want to believe in this. Mm -hmm. Um, But sure enough, when the surgery happened, um, well, before the surgery, my doctor said, you know, what we're hoping is that she cries when she comes out because the mass is starting to not allow her lungs to expand. Um, We gave you steroid shots, hoping that the lungs will be... uh, they'll be formed by then. So that's, that's the thing we're hoping for. So during the surgery, my husband and I were just waiting. Um, and finally, when it was time to like bring her out, we did, they showed, they showed us our baby and she had her eyes open. She was moving and everything, but we didn't hear anything. Um, maybe some grunting. So they took her right away to NICU. And I was just thinking like, okay, she's going to be there for a little bit. They'll sew me up. I'll probably recover for a couple of hours and then I can go see her. So then a doctor comes in from NICU and tells my husband, I need to speak to you in private. So they pull my husband aside and they tell him like, we have her connected to all the machines, especially the one for breathing. We're doing as much as possible, but she's not accepting the treatment like her lungs aren't breathing along with the machine so my husband told them you know try whatever you can um before you give up like do whatever is necessary and they're like okay and my husband stayed there with her for a little bit and then he came back to me and he told me like yeah they're trying whatever they can and then I guess he thought maybe he could cheer me up with this little fun fact he's like but I have a fun fact for you I'm like what is it and he's like well you know how when you have a baby you count your fingers and toes she actually has six fingers and six toes I'm like wait what are you joking with me because right now we don't joke around with me (laughs) and he's like no I'm serious babe and I'm like okay well that's that's fun (laughs) I'm like that'll be something (laughs) um different yeah (laughs) <laughs> I I literally was not expecting that. I didn't know what to think. I was like, okay. So they pulled him aside again, and I wasn't sure why, but it was to let him know that they were taking um taking her off the machine. They had finally decided that that's it. She's she's not gonna be able, she's not gonna make it. Um, and he didn't realize that at that time they had finished sewing me up and they already had her wrapped up in the blanket and gave her to me so she can pass in my arms mm. so they handed her to me you um, didn't know anything huh you didn't know anything like no I didn't know what was going on um I just knew the six fingers and six toes <laughs> um so by the time he was coming back they were already wheeling me down the hallway I was already crying because the nurse handed her to me and just shook her head like no like I'm sorry so which sucked because um in the hallway I had like all my family waiting because they they thought the same that she was just going to be a NICU you you know we'll see her through the glass and that's it but um yeah I had her in my arms they took me to my room and uh they let us uh be with her for I think I was with her for three hours or four hours um everybody in our family got to see her um and then finally well the nurses ended up taking some pictures of her for us took some pictures of us with our baby um and then they took her away and that yep um oh sorry (laughs) yeah they say with grief Grief never ends. It just keeps going. And, you know, the stages repeat themselves. So it's it's something that it doesn't get completely easy. It's still there. But um, yeah. 
But anywho, whew, okay, let me get myself together. Very, very, so, very what was that? It, I said it's a very, very, very hard situation. Oh, yeah, because, you know, your first pregnancy, like right. everything's going well. You don't think anything's going to happen. And this just came out of nowhere. And it happened during the holidays because she was born in December. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we had found out everything around Thanksgiving. And then I gave birth. Yeah, 12, 12. So while I'm in the hospital recovering, my doctor comes in and he tells me or he asks me, would you like to do a biopsy on your daughter to really figure out what was happening? And I said, yeah, I, I want to know. Um, so they do the biopsy. He comes back the next day and he says this. It wasn't just one thing. He said, yeah, that mass was a cyst um, that was growing in her reproductive system. But he said there was so many other things happening. So along with the six finger, six toes, she had a cleft foot, two left lungs. So instead of a right lung and a left lung, she had two left ones, mm -hmm. an extra pancreas. She had a heart defect. What else did she have? Yeah, I think that's about it. So he said, usually when there's so many anomalies happening, um, it's typically a syndrome instead of just saying like, you know, a heart defect. Like there were so many defects, it has to be um, something else. So I asked him, well, what syndrome? And he said, it's nothing like I've ever seen before, so I have to test for it. So they tested her DNA twice, but they couldn't figure it out still. Um, he finally said that we're going to try this special test and see if we can um, test for like any of these rare ones that I have in mind. And sure enough, um, she ended up having a rare disease. It's called Bardet Beetle Syndrome. And there's about, I think there's about 12 types. We are type 12. And the next step was to test my husband and I for uh, the gene. And sure enough, we both have the genes. It's a recessive gene, but we're both carriers. So um, how rare this is, it's uh, one in 250,000 people in the world have it. Maybe like 3,000 people have it in the U.S. and Canada. Wow. Um, it causes everything that I just said my daughter has, but it also causes learning disabilities, um, obesity, because it, it impairs their metabolism and blindness. So they can see within like the first couple of years, but by the time they're in grade school, they're already going blind. Wow. Um, and that might not be for all the types. It could just be for certain types. Mm -hmm. um, they're still doing research on this syndrome. Like, for example, they have a lot of information on the specific gene my husband has, but they don't, my gene that causes a syndrome, they don't have enough information on it. So they're, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done. Um, so it kind of helped knowing what it was. Um, and I guess my next question to my doctor was like, well, what happens in future pregnancies, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and he said, well, there's going to be a 25% chance now with every pregnancy that your baby has the syndrome. 50% will just be carriers like my husband and I. They won't have the syndrome, but they'll have the gene. And they will pass it down to their kids, possibly. And then another 25% that the baby won't have anything. So I was like, okay, um, what's the best, you know, next step that we should take then? Obviously, when I'm healed and everything. Um, I had that conversation maybe like, six months or a year after. Um, and they wanted us to do IVF so then they can uh, they can test the embryos, only implant the healthy embryos in me so then I can have a healthy baby. So with my second child, um, we were we were going to do that. Um, we started out creating the test. 
because there's no test for the syndrome because it's rare. So mm -hmm. they had to use London, um, my first, her DNA, my DNA, my husband's DNA to create this new test. And that's how they would test the embryos. But we only made it that far because then COVID happened. So everything went on pause. Mm -hmm. And it kind of put my husband and I in a limbo, like, well, what do we do? Um, and somebody had recommended me this book. It's funny, I've, I never even met her. Uh, my sister-in-law, she wanted me to talk to her friend who went through not something similar, but she lost um, some, she lost, I think, one or two babies. And what was that? Did she have miscarriages? She, yes, she had miscarriages, but I'm not sure. I could have sworn she lost an infant also. Um, so she thought it would be a great idea for me to talk to her. So I spoke to her. Then she recommended me this book called Childbirth and the Glory. And that book changed everything for me. Um, I just told my husband, you know what? Who cares what the what the doctors say? Let's just put all our trust in God. He's got this. Like if he wants us to have another healthy baby, he's gonna we're gonna have another we're gonna have a healthy baby, sorry. Yeah. Or if it happens again, it happens again. Like there's there's reasons for it, you know? Yeah. Um so sure enough, during COVID, you know, we we weren't really taking care of ourselves, but on Easter, we found out we were pregnant with our second, but I had so much peace in that pregnancy. Um, I I just felt like I he had it all in his hands. And then once they told me her due date was Christmas, it to me it was like a sign like he really has this, mm -hmm. um, especially because the holidays are hard for me. We buried my first the 26th of December. So a day after Christmas. So for him to be like, you know, I'm going to give you something new after this difficulty that you you've been through. I'm going to make the holidays better for you again. So when they told me the 25th, I'm like, wow. Okay. Yeah. He really has his hand in this. Um, and the thing with now with each pregnancy is I don't know if the babies have the syndrome all they can do is check for physical um, defects or anomalies. And sure enough, they didn't see anything. But I still need to genetically test her after she's born. Um, so when it came to doing the C-section with my daughter, my husband and I were traumatized with the whole, the baby has to cry. <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yes, please cry. <laughs> Which is funny because so I, I went into the the surgical room and my doctor asked me if I wanted um, us to play like any playlist. And I created a playlist. I'm like, yes, I need to be calm here. Play this. And uh, That's good. sure enough, when she was born, she was crying. And then I guess what touched us was my husband always said, have you ever heard the the song by Phil Wickham, Only Hope? Um, I think so. Yeah. So yeah. he always said, that's my song for my first daughter. So right when that song started playing, that's when our baby was born. She oh. was crying. We were bawling. We're like, yes. <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, it was Everyone a good time. Was crying. Were crying, <laughs> mom and dad were crying. Oh yeah. It was, it was a way better experience. Um, <laughs> So that really made up for it. But now we're pregnant with our third. Um, again, they're checking for any defects. Um, I've been cleared, but now we just wait. Is she, is she going to cry? <laughs> or, you know, yeah. so that's that's the only downfall with each pregnancy is, you know, as much as like I want to share and tell the world and everything, it's like, uh. There's always that what if, you know, um, and I know as, as much as I'm trusting God, it's something that my husband and I like only want to go through ourselves, go like through only between us. Um, so that's why a lot of people don't even know I'm pregnant right now. Um, our family didn't know till I was six months. That's how like wow. secretly we keep it. 
Um, yeah, my mother-in-law is like, wait, this is something you have to tell me. And it's like, yeah, but given our circumstance of what happened, you know, yeah. um, so they, they get it. Um, so now we'll, we'll see in about a month. <laughs> Oh man, that's oh, that's really tough. Um, I can't even imagine like the stress that you guys are going through. You know, like uh, how we were talking before we started recording. Um, yeah, you know, we could say that we trust God and truly do trust God, but we're still human, mm -hmm. and that doubt always, you know, somehow sinks in one way or another, right? Um, oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, there there definitely has been more anxiety in this pregnancy. And like I was telling you before, I don't know if it's because we have a daughter now and now she's involved and we're telling her, you know, you're going to be a big sister. Um, she's seeing us put furniture together. She's getting excited. We're doing the whole, the, sibling, the baby's going to bring her a gift. That way there's no... <laughs> There's no um, jealousy or anything. Hopefully that works. So now she's involved. Her emotions are involved, you know? So it's kind of like there's a little more anxiety with it. Um, I mean, even if the baby cries, we still need a test. We need to test her. Um, mm -hmm. We did test Francesca. And um, now we call her a miracle baby because she ended up not having anything she's not a carrier no syndrome nothing so I was like wow he really had his hand in in that pregnancy and now I'm just praying like please have your hand in this one too <laughs> like as much as I might feel a little weak and a little more emotional and I guess grief is starting to come back right a little more yeah those memories right not from mm -hmm. Francesca but the ones from before from that first pregnancy and the first experience I think um you know it's not only just like a tough situation but I think it's also traumatizing you know oh definitely and then grief never ends it just it keeps going I mean does it get easier a little bit it does and you know what helps too is um I know it, it's kind of awkward when when other parents are like how many kids do you have and I don't want to say, you know, I just have one. It's like, no, my baby was born. Like, she was alive, even if it was for, like, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I always say two, and then they'll they'll start asking me about her. And I love it. I, I think what helps is talking about her like she, like she happened. And it's like, well, she would have been five, you know. Mm -hmm. um, her name is this and, and everything. But then they always feel awkward, like, oh, I'm so sorry I brought it up. And it's like, no, I... I love talking about her. I love knowing that she, like she happened, you know, and then um, we're going to do the same with my daughter. Talk to her about her older sister. Like we take her to the cemetery to visit her, put flowers. Um, I think that's definitely one thing that helps is, is talking about her. And I've talked to other moms who, who've also lost an infant or a child and they say the same thing. Um, talking about their kid helps. Like, people might feel like maybe it's not helping. Maybe I just won't bring it up. Because I have some some people close to us that won't bring up our baby at all. And then I have other people that that do. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it definitely helps. But like you said, you know, she was, you know, she was born. She was a baby. Like, I feel like not talking about it, not only just, like, mask your uh, – you know, your grief, but um, also, like, makes it seem like she never existed. Which yeah. She, she did. Exactly. So that kind of, it brings me comfort. And um, I always say that she was just the lucky one because, um, you know, a lot, a lot of parents would, and it's part of it, a part of grief, you know, I think it's the second, um, the second stage of grief because it's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. So anger, you know, a lot of parents get angry at God. I actually got angry at myself because I feel like I should have advocated for myself more or, 
or I got angry at the doctors thinking like, you know, why didn't you catch this or, or stuff like that. But, um, I couldn't get angry with God. I saw it as in, um, he saved her because she would have suffered so much. Um, yeah. And I imagine how much suffering Brent, my husband and I would have gone through like seeing her suffer, seeing her in pain. Um, and what, what was cute was my father-in-law, since he's a pastor, he, he spoke at her funeral and he said, you know what? She, she doesn't have to go through heartbreak. She doesn't have to go through the stresses of this world. You know, she's probably looking down at, at us thinking like, why are you crying? You know, cause she's already in paradise. So it's like, he ultimately saved her. So that's why I say like, you know what? She's the lucky one. <laughs> she got to be in paradise right away. You know, we got to hold on to her for a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. <laughs> um, what do you think has helped you um, other than talking about her? What, what else has, has helped you with the grieving process? Um, let's see, definitely talking about her, but then also, you know, at night when I pray, I always, it's like my time to talk to mm -hmm. her or tell God, like, give her a hug for me or it's something so small, but it helps. Um, and time did help a little bit. And not only that, my second daughter has helped me so much. It's kind of like London was the one I wanted, but Francesca was the one I needed to help me kind of heal too. Because um, now I have to be strong for her. Um, so that has helped. Yeah. Um. So what if, you know, if there's a mom out there listening um, and she's going through the same thing, like what, what advice or like encouragement will you give her? You know, after everything we went through, I would say, take your time to heal. Like it, it happened. Like you need to grieve. Um. I saw the opposite with my husband. He didn't grieve. He felt the need to be strong for me, but I would tell him, like, she's your daughter too. You lost your daughter. You need to grieve. Mm -hmm. um, you have to let it out, you know, as much as there's going to be a lot of people coming to come for you. If you need time by yourself, like, take that time. Cry. Uh, go throw something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know have a feeling right yeah the biggest thing is like you you gotta let it out it's so hard but then after that um I think like letting it out is gonna help you find that acceptance a little bit um yeah like I said I I had to really reflect on it all um and really see like the good in it instead of thinking you know you know, my daughter left me or like, like I said, she, she's in paradise. She's not suffering. So that, that just that thought helped me tremendously. Like, like there are no words, just, just that, but definitely grieve, take your time, take as much time to grieve. I mean, that first, that first uh, half or that first period is going to be the hardest, but you know what? You're going to get through it. Um, it's like I was telling you um, about that one scripture, Romans 5, how it talks about suffering produces perseverance and hope. You are going to persevere. You are going to gain hope after that. Um, and then also your baby happened, whether it was a miscarriage or an infant loss or a child loss, like it happened. You carry that baby. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it talking about it's gonna gonna help too. And then also, um, I feel like there's, there, 
it's kind of more common now than than before right or at least now like you hear it a little more but then at the same time you know I feel like a lot of women just suffer in, in silence you know like not tell anybody mm -hmm. that, that maybe the person sitting next to them you know has gone through the same thing so just like talking about it could make you feel like you're not alone in this journey and um you know just have someone else that understands where you're going through oh yeah definitely I think that's what helped um my husband more so because at when we lost our daughter two of his other friends lost their kids um one was a miscarriage and one was an infant loss as well. So him being able to share that with them helped so much. Like there's, like you said, it, it is, it is becoming common to like put it, uh, to not be silent about it. Like even celebrities, who was it that, that lost their baby? Um, Chrissy Teigen, um, how she put it out there. And then when she did, all these mothers started speaking up and it was beautiful to see, well, it was sad, you know, that we're part of this club, but beautiful to see women come together and like support each other and, you know, be able to talk about their grieving and, and everything. Right. Yeah. Just that, that um support, like that community, like for support, right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's sad that it has to be about this, but um you know just knowing that you're not alone that there's other people who are hurting just as much as you are um yeah. going through something very similar mm -hmm, exactly uh so you already shared uh the romance fight but like is um uh do you have any like other bible verse or it could be the same one but uh, a word or poem song and something that just keeps you going when um you feel like giving up I would say song definitely um and it's another worship song it's uh I raise I raise a hallelujah <laughs> and um what I like about it is when I first heard it I heard the live version and the singer starts saying how uh, he was talking about a baby boy who was sick. And I think he was passing away. And he they were talking about how, like, no, we, we're we going to look um, death and fear straight in the eye and say, not today. We're going to raise a hallelujah and give it all to God. And he's going to, you know, conquer and they, I guess they all started worshiping in, in the hospital mm -hmm. um, and other people in their homes, like coming together in prayer. And sure enough, the baby made it. So that, that song gives me hope too. Um, as I wish I would have had the lyrics pulled up because just reading you some of the, the lyrics, it's like, let's see. And like you know, like you said, like the meaning behind it, like uh, how did how did the song was born? Oh, here it is. Yeah. Um, like for example, it says, "I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, um, louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roar." So you you can be, you know, uh, in your darkest storm and everything, but you're still gonna you're going to persevere. You're going to sing louder. You're going to, you know, raise that hallelujah, you know, fear you lost your hold on me. Like, that's it. Like, so that, that definitely helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like that song too. Um, yeah. I, I think there isn't, um, I don't know if I'm even saying this right, but, uh, there isn't anything more like, beautiful than like just praising God while you're going through something so heavy so dark you know yes. mm -hmm. I totally agree with you because it's I feel like it's that hope that little light at the end of the tunnel like you're still telling your little train I think I can <laughs> 
Anyway, I'm like, I'm like <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you so much, uh, Monica, for for sharing your journey, and um, you know, I'll be praying for you, for you and your husband, and for this uh, new, you know, beautiful baby that is going to be born a hundred percent great, healthy, and um, so I'm believing that for you guys. I'm believing that God has a hand on this pregnancy as well. Just like, you know, on Francesca, this baby's going to be born healthy. Thank you so much. And ready to give you some trouble. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Partner up with her sister. Yes. <laughs> so I'll be praying yeah, thank for you guys. So and, um, just, you know, I just want to thank you. I know that, you know, sometimes it's really hard to go back and think and um, remember, you know, this really hard situation. But, um, like you know, like we were saying, talking about it. Um, not only helps us, you know, heal in a way, but also, you know, can help um, others to be encouraged or give them hope. Yeah. Yeah, that's all I, I could hope is, you know, my story helping other mothers to, you know, talk about it as well, get that support, knowing that, you know, they're not the only ones going through this. There's so many people that are willing to lend an ear or not even lend an ear. Maybe some people just want to hold you in your grief and that's it. Right. You know? Well, thank you so much. And um, I will see you ladies in the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. I hope this episode inspired you. If you like this podcast, please share on social media and tag me on Instagram at the Brave and Her. I would love to hear your stories of bravery.